A boy and his friends discovered the legend of a 300-year-old treasure lost at sea. In Belgium in 1955, something interesting happens in a busy town square. Here, a young and clever reporter named Tintin, dressed nicely, just had his portrait done by Georges Prosper Remy, a famous local artist. Tintin, always looking for a new adventure, walks through the crowd. As he moves, he spots a small pirate ship called the Unicorn inside a glass case on a merchant's table. The merchant, an old man with many tales, says he bought this ship from a sailor's sale. Interested, Tintin decides to buy the ship for just a pound. But as soon as Tintin picks up the ship, the action starts. A tall man with a thick mustache and an American accent approaches. Staring at the ship, he seems eager, offering Tintin double what he paid. However, Tintin feels there's more to this ship and turns him down. The man looking worried quickly warns Tintin, get out while you still can, as if there's danger nearby. Right after the American leaves, another man comes in, a skinny man with a sharp black beard wearing a bright red coat. He also wants the small ship. He tells Tintin that the ship was originally from Marlin Spike Hall, a big place he now owns, and he wants the ship back where it belongs. Even though he tells Tintin to name his price, Tintin decides to keep the ship and turns him down. As Tintin walks away, the man in red asks the merchant about the stubborn buyer. Who is that young man? He inquires. The merchant smiles and answers, Everyone knows him. That's Tintin. Back at his apartment, Tintin is full of thoughts about the ship. He decides to look at it closely and starts searching for a magnifying glass. Just then, a sleek Siamese cat slips through the open window, catching the attention of Tintin's smart but playful white dog, Snowy. A wild chase starts, with Snowy running after the cat, causing a mess. During the chaos, Snowy bumps into the table where the ship is, knocking it to the floor. The masts break off. As Tintin picks up the pieces, he doesn't see a small metal cylinder fall out of the mast hole and roll under the table. His attention stays on the broken ship, unaware of the important clue that just slipped away. Eager to learn more, Tintin and Snowy go to a maritime museum library. There. Among the tall shelves of books, Tintin finds an old book about a ship called the Unicorn. The book says this ship, led by the famous Sir Francis Haddock, sank with a cargo of rum and tobacco. However, there were whispers that it carried a secret treasure too. The captain, upset by the loss, thought his family was cursed from then on. As Tintin reads through the stormy night, he discovers that what happened to the Unicorn remains a big mystery. Despite many tries by explorers and scientists, no one has figured out the true story. The book says only a true descendant of Captain Haddock could discover the secret. After his research, Tintin comes home to find the model ship gone. Thinking the skinny man from the town square might have taken it, Tintin decides to sneak into Marlin Spike Hall. In a dark, spooky room, he sees another ship just like his, under glass. But as he gets closer, someone knocks him out. When Tintin wakes up, he finds himself looking at the skinny man and his butler, Nestor. Tintin asks for his ship back, but soon finds out that this ship, although it looks the same and is called the Unicorn, is a different model. It's not broken like his. As Tintin is being escorted out of Marlin Spike Hall, the butler, looking serious, tells him to make sure he has all the pieces of his ship. Confused, Tintin returns to his apartment only to find his door slightly open and his place in a mess. Someone has searched it. In the mess, near the dresser, where he last saw his ship, Tintin finds the metal cylinder he had missed before. Inside, he discovers a scroll with a mysterious poem and odd symbols. It's the American man who wanted to buy the unicorn earlier. The man, looking scared, warns of danger and says people are being killed over this information. Before Tintin can ask more, shots are fired. Bullets hit the door, and the American falls down in the hallway, bleeding heavily. Shocked, Tintin steps outside just in time to see a blue sedan speeding away. Returning to the scary scene in the hallway, he sees a newspaper next to the injured man, with bloody fingerprints on some of the letters. The next day, Tintin is talking deeply with two detectives who are also clumsy twin brothers, Thompson and Thompson. They tell Tintin that the man who died, named Barnaby Dawes, was an FBI agent. Tintin talks about the newspaper he found, noting that the letters marked with blood spell Karabujan. After the meeting, the detectives warn Tintin about a sneaky thief causing trouble around town. As they leave Tintin's apartment, they almost catch the thief, who also runs into Tintin. In the confusion, Tintin soon realizes his wallet and the important secret paper inside is stolen. Thompson and Thompson promise to find Tintin's wallet, but Tintin's day isn't done with problem. Back at his apartment, he's suddenly grabbed by several big men who kidnap him and put him into a box. His loyal dog, Snowy, quickly follows his owner, sneaking onto a big ship called the Karabu John. 
on board, Tintin meets the thin man from before who introduces himself as Captain Ivanovich Sakharin. Sakharin is also looking for the paper Tintin had found. He says he has another paper just like it. Even though Tintin says he doesn't have the paper anymore, he and Snowy end up locked up as Sakharin and his crew think about what to do next. Tintin, always clever, manages to escape his locked room on the ship by squeezing through home for boy, whizzing through a small window to another room. There he meets Captain Archibald Haddock, a Scottish sailor who is struggling because his crew has turned against him to join Saccharine. Even though Haddock is drunk and angry, Tintin agrees to help him get away. During their talk, Tintin learns that Haddock is related to the Haddocks of Marlinspike Hall. Tintin tells him about the scroll and the legend that only a Haddock can uncover the secrets of the unicorn. Haddock remembers his grandfather telling him an important story when he was dying, but sadly he has forgotten it. Haddock also says he is the last of three brothers, which gives Tintin a big hint. As they plan to escape from the ship, Tintin sneaks past the radio room. He hears something about the Milanese Nightingale and gets the coordinates for the ship's next destination, Bagar. Their escape gets more intense as they run away in a small boat, chased by Saccharine's men in a seaplane. Tintin quickly shoots at the plane, damaging its engine and forcing it to land. After they capture the two pilots, Tintin fixes the plane, and soon he, Haddock, and Snowy are flying towards Bagger. However, their trip is cut short by a storm over the desert, leading to a crash. Stranded, the trio ends up walking across the vast desert. In the scorching desert heat, Captain Haddock struggles with his past and alcohol, causing him to see things that aren't there. During these strong visions, he remembers a story his grandfather once told him. Haddock begins to tell the story of his ancestor, Sir Francis Haddock, who was the captain of the Unicorn. This ship was attacked by pirates led by the fearsome Red Rackham, a pirate chief with a dark red scarf and faced terrible danger. While the Unicorn was thought to carry just regular cargo, Rackham suspected there was more. Sir Francis showed a hidden compartment full of gold and jewels, but Rackham tricked him, leading to the crew's tragic death by sharks. In a desperate move, Sir Francis destroyed the unicorn to prevent Rackham from getting the treasure. After surviving the blast, Sir Francis was cursed by Rackham, who eerily warned they'd meet again, in another time, in another place. As Haddock tells his story, he shockingly realizes that Saccharine is related to the wicked Red Rackham. Just when things look bleak in the desert, they are luckily found and saved by patrolling soldiers who take them to a fort in Afgar. There, more alcohol helps Haddock remember the last parts of his grandfather's tale. When they finally get to Bagar, they unexpectedly meet the Thompson twins again, who are disguised and blending in with the crowd. They have found Tintin's stolen wallet and the important paper inside. Now, Tintin, Captain Haddock, Snowy, and the Thompson twins are at the big palace of Omar Ben Salad, believed to have another model of the unicorn ship. The palace is also hosting a performance by the famous opera singer Bianca Castafiore, known as the Milanese Nightingale. As she sings her powerful opera notes, the glass case with the unicorn model breaks into tiny pieces. Taking advantage of this, Saccharine tells his pet falcon to grab the last scroll hidden inside the ship's mast. A wild chase starts through the busy streets of the city. In a tense moment, Tintin has to give the scrolls to Saccharine to save Haddock and Snowy from a dangerous situation. After the trade, Saccharine leaves on the Caraboujon. Feeling beaten, Tintin almost loses hope, but then he gets an idea. Remembering the ship's communication signals from his time in the radio room, Tintin realizes they can track the ship through Interpol. As the Caraboujon returns to the port where their journey started, Tintin and his friends with another seaplane are ready to face Saccharine. The fight gets intense when Saccharine, armed and desperate, jumps into a dock crane to fight Haddock, who is in another crane. The battle is like a sword fight, high above the ground. Saccharine almost manages to destroy the three scrolls, but Tintin steps in just in time to save them. As the day starts at the docks, Tintin and Haddock put the scrolls together and find coordinates that lead them straight to Marlinspike Hall. Haddock remembers a specific seller from his childhood, suggesting a hidden secret. They find that the original seller had been hidden by Sir Francis Haddock after losing the house. Determined, they break through the fake wall and find the real seller. Inside the secret cellar at Marlinspike Hall, Tintin, Haddock, and Snowy find a statue of St. John the Evangelist. Tintin remembers a line from the poem, and then shines forth the eagle's cross, and makes a connection. 
He realizes that St. John is often represented by an eagle and is called the Eagle of Patmos. This insight leads to a big discovery. St. John is the eagle mentioned in the poem. Next to the statue, they see a globe. Haddock notices an extra island on it and thinks it's a mistake. But Tintin, always keen, argues it's not a mistake. He suggests that Sir Francis Haddock made this globe for a descendant who, knowing the sea well, would spot even a tiny, unusual thing like an extra island. A man who could solve such a tricky hint. Feeling hopeful, Haddock pushes on the small island on the globe. To their surprise, the globe opens up, revealing it was actually a hidden button. Inside, they find Red Rackham's treasure along with Sir Francis's old hat. Full of joy and feeling complete, Haddock tries on the hat and says, Their adventure is finished. But Tintin, always curious, finds another clue at the bottom of the empty globe pointing to where more treasure might be. Excited by their find and the new clue, Tintin and Haddock prepare for their next big adventure, an ocean journey to find the secret, long-lost treasure of Red Rackham. Thanks for your time.